Hi, my name's Bob Whipple, and I'm also called the Trust Ambassador. This program is a program that I did uh, at the Commons on Champs in Denver, Colorado on March 7th of 2018. It's a compressed version of the program that I normally do on the impact of trust, and there's some really neat recent data about trust worldwide that I think you'll enjoy. That's great to hear. Can you all hear me okay? Is this mic going to work? Great. Uh, it's wonderful to be here in sunny Denver, uh, coming from snowy Rochester. We've had a really snowy year this year. I have to tell you right from the start that I'm petrified uh, because this step here, one of these days, I'm just going to take a step and go flat on, my, flat on my stomach. But I learned a line that I'll use in case that happens from a friend of mine named Tim Gard. He's a comedian, and he actually did, had this happen to him. He was on a stage like this. He's a rather rotund uh, gentleman. And he was on a stage like this, and he actually got so excited with his props that he fell fo face forward, flat on his stomach, on, uh, on, on the ground. And he immediately, what a, what a recovery, he immediately said, and now, folks, I'll take some questions from the floor. <laughs> I don't think I'm that quick. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to get right to the topic because I do have an awful lot of information that I want to share with you, and I want to make sure we get through as much of it as we possibly can. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of data and a lot of information about trust. We're going to take a deeper dive than maybe you're used to doing, and hopefully that will be useful to you. I will give this presentation, the, the slides, to Bob, and he will have a be able to email out a copy of the presentation so you don't need to take detailed notes. You'll have the slides available. Fair enough? Okay. The first thing is I'm sure if you're sitting there saying, what's in this for me? And what it really is is thinking about, we're going to be thinking about the impact of trust, first of all, what it really means. And of course, we all know to a certain extent what it means. But we're going to go much deeper into how much trust impacts an organization. We're going to share some data that, quite frankly, is very startling, very scary, and very fresh. When I was hiking in 1966 in the Tetons and up in Montana, I was hiking with a, a friend of mine. He happened to be my physics professor. And we're, we're up in the mountains, and it was in June, so therefore there was still a lot of snow in, in the mountains. And so we would quite frequently lose the trail. You know, you're walking along a trail and all of a sudden all you can see is snow. So what we would do, and I think this is standard practice, you all mountain people, you know, you, you, one person stays put and the other person goes out a couple hundred yards and walks around to try to pick up the trail, right? So my friend Dick, I stayed put. He went out and walked around and he came back about five minutes later and he was white as a sheet, he was shaking. I said, what's the matter? He said, well, he said, I just saw some bear crap on the snow. And I said, Dick, we've seen that before. What's the big deal? He says, yeah, Bob, but this was fresh. And I said, how fresh? And he said, it was steaming. <laughs> so I'm going to be sharing some steaming data with you <laughs> this afternoon that I hope you'll find interesting. And then we'll talk about things like about how do you repair damaged trust, because that happens all the time, doesn't it? So things like that. We'll have some fun. I'll throw in a few zingers here and there to keep things lively. Hopefully, if anybody nods off, I'll kick you. <laughs> First of all, it's a common word. We use it every day, many times a day. In fact, when you start keeping track, if you, if you watch television at all, I don't know if any of you watch television, but. Uh, you know, you're going to hear trust almost every advertisement is going to find that word in there. And we use it all the time, but when we think about what it is, what is it? Anybody have a definition that you like? See, isn't it interesting that it's such a common word and we know it when we see it, and yet when we go to try to put our finger on it, it's a little bit elusive. Well, I'm going to take some of the mystery out of it. First of all, we tend to think of trust as one thing. It's either I trust you or I don't trust you, 
at this particular point. It's me and someone else. M me and my son, or me and my wife, or whatever. And that's how we think of it, as a singular thing. But it's not that way at all. Trust is much more complex than that. So I'm going to go through a few of the categories, and I don't need to dwell on them, because you know them instinct and instantly and instinctively. For example, you have my back. I can count on you. That's trust, right? Consistency. You do what you say you're going to do. That's trust, right? How about you act in my best interest? And the interesting thing about that one is I may not even like it at the time that you're acting in my best interest, but if I trust you, I'm thinking that you're going to do what you believe is in my best interest, even if there's some tough love involved there. Or maybe we share core values in an organization or just together. We have some core values that we believe in, and therefore we trust each other to always model those values. Very important part of trust. Here's a huge one that we don't often think about. Safety. It's safe for me to say what is on my mind in an appropriate way at an appropriate time and not have to worry about being punished for it. And in an organizational sense, and we're going to talk a lot about organizational trust here today, this is a big one. This has huge leverage when you think about leaders and leadership. And most leaders aren't thinking about that safety aspect. I have a quote that I love to share on that particular thing. I say, the absence of fear is the incubator of trust. Because when, you don't, when you're not fearful, trust will spontaneously grow. Vulnerability. You're willing to make, uh, admit mistakes, listen to me, right? That's a kind of trust. Dependency. We know this one well with our children, right? I, I depend on you to keep me safe. My daughter taught me a lesson about that when she was only three or four years old. I used to travel a lot. I worked for Kodak. That was a company. Never mind. <laughs> we, we won't go there. But there was a company called Kodak, and I used to travel a lot. And, and I remember when I would come home from a trip, my daughter, Priscilla, would run up to me, and she'd say, Daddy, Daddy, twirl me. She wouldn't say, I want a hug or something like that. She'd twirl me. So I'd put my bags down, and I'd pick her up. And I have to do this carefully because i got a bad ankle. But i pick her up, and I'd twirl her around and twirl her around. And she'd, her hair would be flying. And she'd say, Daddy, Daddy, don't stop. Don't stop. So I'd keep going as long as I could, put her down, a little like this, you know. And then I'd hear that word. What's the word? Again, right? They always do that to me. So I'd pick her up. And as long as I kept, go I kept going, kept going around and around, and I finally put her down, and I'm staggering in the kitchen like this, and my wife walks in from the dining room, and she says, how many martinis did you have on the plane? <laughs> but the thing that Priscilla taught me in, in that, all of those twirling things, was all the times I twirled her, I hardly ever dropped her. <laughs> and so, that's the message, is that trust, there's a reciprocal nature of trust. Is there not? Trust goes in one direction, but it also goes in the other direction. When we're thinking about trust between people, it's always bi-directional. And it's not always the same in one direction versus the other. Does that make sense? It can be different. And so this, this leads me to what I call the first law of trust. If you want to see more trust in your group, you need to show more trust in them. This is something that many leaders don't, don't think about. They're interested in having more trust, but they're not necessarily interested in showing more trust. So that's the first law of trust is if you want more trust, you need to demonstrate more trust. And I have a little demonstration that I like to use to underscore that. Have any of you ever seen this little device? No takers, huh? All right. Well, this is very simple. It's, the idea is this. Trust may be the same in one direction versus the other direction, or it could be quite different. So we have a, a lot of trust on this side of the equation, and not so much trust on this side of the equation, depending on what's going on. Does that make sense? That could happen? 
But then in a very short period of time, with not too much effort or not too much things happening, the thing could reverse. And the, long, the greater trust is over on this side and not much trust over here. Did you see how I did that? It just can change in not too much. If a phone call, a letter, something weird going on. And of course, what we would like, do you all see what I'm doing here? <laughs> What we would like in our lives is we would like e trust to be equal on both sides, wouldn't we? That's the objective. The really thing, when I do this for engineers, they freak out because I show them that the two halves of the thing are not connected at all. <laughs> There's no string that goes through there at all. I can't figure it out. Trust is very much associated with values, and we're going to talk about the, the role of values in trust, because they form the basis on which we build trust. Does that make sense to you? Well, I'm saying bedrock beliefs, it's hard to change. Our values generally don't change a lot throughout our lives, believe it or not. You get some values programmed in at an early age, and where do they come from? Parents mostly. Grandparents sometimes, church maybe, school, friends, and they really don't change much throughout our life. But they're extremely important, and it's extremely important that we understand not only our values, but the other person's values too, because they have to be at least reasonably aligned or we've got problems. Make sense? And this last bullet, in a, in a business sense, we need to be very religious about calling people out when they're not following the values. If we have a set of values that we've said we're following in this organization and someone chooses not to do that, that's a, that's a red stop, is it not? All agree? Okay. Uh, I wanted to, I'm gonna talk a little bit about accountability. Is accountability kind of a big time word these days? We talk about accountability quite a bit. And unfortunately, in most organizations and with most leaders, we do accountability poorly. Is that, do we? We do accountability in a, in a wrong way. It's like a punitive thing. We find something lacking or something that didn't work out right and go and hold the person accountable in a punitive way. There's an alternative to that and I'm gonna share that with you a little bit later about how we can do better with accountability and trust. And just recognize, are you all, are you, I was really impressed with the diversity of, of, of occupations and people and mindsets in this group, but I'm sure that you're all pretty well versed in emotional intelligence, are you not? Okay, and that is very, very closely linked to building trust, is it not? So if, in fact, I honestly believe that if I'm working with a leader and I'm trying to make that leader into a better leader, one of the first places I'm gonna go is, how's the level of emotional intelligence in this person? Is there a work to be done there? Because generally there is, okay? Let me just stop, any questions or concerns? Am I going too fast, too slow, what's, are you okay? Everything all right? Okay. We trust you. Okay. <laughs> so. We think of trust primarily as one thing, and we think of it in terms of people. We think of it at that top line. Do I trust my son? Do I trust my wife? Do I trust my boss? Well, that's generally where we go. But you gotta realize that the trust manifests itself in our lives in hundreds of other ways. In every product that you touch, if you try to take a vitamin pill in the morning, when you take a vitamin pill in the morning, you're not thinking about the chemicals that you're putting in your body, are you? Generally, maybe some of you are. Or you're not thinking about the person who packaged the pills, right? You just take the pill. You walk into the bathroom in the morning and you flip on the switch and the lights go on. You get in your car and you turn on the ignition and the engine runs and there's lots of explosions going on under the hood. And you step on the brake and the car stops. And we don't think about it, it's just there. So in every product, you, you buy a chainsaw, 
you're going to trust that chainsaw, I hope. <laughs> or you're going to cut your leg off. Uh, organizations, every organization that we deal with, uh, we have some level of trust. Any organization that we, we work with. Uh, that, that one on media is a special case, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail here in a few minutes, because trust in the media is a very interesting phenomenon these days. Uh, trust in systems, the government, bridges. When you drive over a, an overpass, I think most of you are not worried about whether you're going to fall into the river, right? Or a bridge. You know, you just aren't thinking about it. But I was in an engineering company earlier this year. And I'm there and I say, when you drive over a bridge, you're not thinking about falling into the river. And he says, oh, yes, I am. I'm a civil engineer, and that's what I do for a living. So I think about it every day. So it's a mindset thing. The point here is that by the time you get to work in the morning, you have experienced trust several hundred times in your life. But 99% of it is just going by and you're not thinking about it because there's no failure. The brakes stop the car. No problem. But if the brakes didn't stop the car, that's a big deal for you. Make sense? So think about trust in these different ways, not just the interpersonal side. But looking, when you look at the interpersonal side, you say, how about my trust in my boss? What's that look like? Well, it's, you know, how much, do I trust him or do I? There's lots of variables involved in that. I tried to plot them and I ran out of axes. It was, I couldn't. That, that's what, that was the best I could do. You know, there's lots of different variables in whether or not you trust another person. Do I, do, does that other person show that he cares about me? Is that other person competent or consistent? That comes from Covey's work. What does he call it? Competent uh, and character. Have any of you read the Covey, Covey stuff? Competence and character. But so it's a lot of things, and at any point in time, you pick and you say, well, that's how much I trust the person. And then five minutes later, after a phone call or an email or something like that, it could be different. It's a dynamic situation. It's around us all the time, and it's very dynamic. So the key point so far, trust is more complex than we think of it. It's not a simple concept. Trust requires living your values. Trust is bilateral, two ways. And it's critical for a team to be successful. Trust is enhanced by emotional intelligence. Those are the key points so far. OK? Ready to go? Yeah. OK. Let's talk about how long does it take. A lot of people would say, gee, you know, Bob, it takes years to be able to trust another person. And you think about that in a family sense. You know, maybe it takes years to build up a level of trust. But in fact, I'm, I have a different opinion about that. I think full mature trust does take a long time, and it does take constant tending, just like love. I believe it's the same kind of thing. You constantly have to work on trust. But I also believe that you can establish trust with another person very quickly. You all buy that? How many of you read the book Blink? by Malcolm Gladwell. Okay, so you already know. The idea is we human beings have a remarkable ability to size each other up in a heartbeat. We all met each other. You met several people on the way in today. And you sized these people up in less than 10 seconds. I have a whole program. I can't get into it here because we just don't have time. But I have a whole program on planting a seed of trust with other people in the first 10 seconds. Because I believe it's possible to do that. It doesn't mean it's mature trust. It doesn't mean it's been tested. But it does mean that you've, made, you've, you've got that. Basically, if you plant the seed well towards trust, then your progress towards trust is going to go at 10 times the rate than it would if, for some reason, you, you didn't. You know, I met a CEO a while ago. And while shaking his hand, he was looking over here, you know, somebody's shoe or something like that. And like, you know, hello, no connection at all, just terrible. So that happens. But most of the time, if we do it right and do it well, trust can be established fairly quickly, and then we get a momentum going and keep, keep working on it. Transparency. Is it right to be more transparent? 
Hello? Sure. Yeah. yeah. We, yes. well, we, we think of transparency in the fact that we know that be hiding things from people inappropriately is going to destroy trust. And we know all the time that we, when we measure what people, what bugs people in companies, companies of all sizes and all industries, what's the biggest problem around here? Comes back number one or number two problem in every survey you'll ever see, every quality of life survey, communications. That's the problem, okay? So we know this, and yet, being transparent is not always a good strategy. Can you buy that? Can you buy that there has to be some judgment involved as well? Because after all, there are some situations where being transparent will land you in jail. If you're the CEO of a company who's, ex who's thinking about merging with another company and that changes the valuation of things because you told your people, uh, you're in jail, pal. So, and there are some times when being transparent is just plain not kind. It's just mean. You know, some of the things you think should not come out of your mouth. <laughs> I hope. I hope you'll agree with that. So, in general, in most organizations, I think we err on the side of not being as transparent as we could be. People are appreciative and will tolerate bad news um, better than no news only to find out later that it was being withheld. That's the killer. Am I right? So challenge when the HR manager, anybody an HR manager, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, when the HR manager says, gee, we don't want to talk about that yet because we'll have sabotage, people will get mad. Uh, in general, what you find is people are much more tolerant of bad news if they're treated like adults and given the information in an appropriate way. So challenge the gag rules because most of the time they're not really smart. That's my, my thesis. You all buy that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to talk about the relationship between ethics and trust a little bit here, because we're going to get into some data here. Would you agree with me that most ethical situations, even the worst one, take an Enron situation, okay? So that's probably easy for all of us to relate to, that when, you, if you look at that thing, you say, well, they were doing wrong stuff. Everybody knows that. They knew they were doing wrong stuff. There was no, you know, it just they talked themselves into that it was all right to do. Well, how did they get there? Here's how they got there. If you go back and look and you go back and back and back and find out what happened. Well, at one point, somebody said, you know, we can show the things this way, which is the conventional way, and, the, and it's okay, or we can show the quarterly results this way, it's legal, it's okay to do, there's nothing immoral or wrong about this thing. It's unconventional a little bit, but we can do it, and it shows us up in a better light. Which one do you want to do? Well, most people would say, especially if you're under quarterly pressure to get your numbers, most people would say, well, let's look, get the one that makes us look the best. And so, but what we've done here is we've, we've taken a little bit of a baby step toward the line. We're not over the line, but we're heading toward the line. But it's okay, it's okay to do this. And then what happens is we start to talk ourselves into through rationalization. Are we good at rationalizing? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We can think, oh boy. So anyway, so the next time it comes up, we can do a little bit more. We can do this plus a little bit more, and it's still legal, and so we're still okay. No problem, right? But we get into this pattern, and now we're on a slippery slope, are we not? Because now, the next time we're, we're faced with a judgment, now we're only making a little teeny change from what we already agreed was right. It's hardly noticeable. It's okay. And first thing you know, through that pattern of logic, we walk ourselves off the deep edge until we're in an Enron situation. Does that make sense? And so what's really important is to create an organization, a culture, where the whistleblower or the person that says, wait a minute, I don't think that's consistent with our values, or I don't think that's the right way to show this, can say that 
and know that he or she is not going to get clobbered for saying it. If you've built up an organization of trust, then when there's something that's getting closer to the line than we should be, you've got, if I have 100 people working for me in an organization, let's say you're all reporting to me in an organization, and I'm thinking about doing something that's just a little bit cloudy maybe, okay, if I thought about it, but I'm not thinking about it. I'm rationalizing what's going on. I'm doing my thing. But I've got 100 people, and each one of you is capable of saying, hold on, Bob, I'm not seeing that the way, same way you do. Let's talk about that. To at least bring it up and know they're not going to get killed for it. That protects me from rationalizing my way into a compromised situation. Does that make sense to you? And so I believe that's the mechanism by which we can keep off the slippery slope. It's like a mirror. We have a mirror that's there that people are willing to say, look at yourself, Bob. You're talking yourself into something that's not really right. This may be quasi right, but it's not really right. Let's think that one through. And then I have the wonderful chance to say, jeepers, I didn't see it that way. Thank goodness for you for being there to, to tell me about that, because you're right. That isn't exactly right, and I can do the right thing. OK? So I believe that's a way that ethics helps us, or trust helps ethics. We have an ethics award in Rochester called the, we call it the Ethi, uh, from, the, from the Emmy. We call it the Ethi. And uh, what we do is we encourage companies to, uh, that, that, are, that believe they're operating in an ethical manner to apply for this award every year. We've run it since 2003. And they go through a process and they have to apply for it and, and they send in a little application that only has four questions. So they're not really, it's not really very burdensome. And they answer these questions and a lot of them will say, well, we're not perfect. Well, you don't have to be perfect to win an ethi. What you have to be, you have to have a really good ethical culture, which says that we recognize that there may be some times when we'll make a mistake. How do we react when we make a mistake? How do we do that? What, what do we do? So we challenge organizations to come forward, volunteer themselves, put, and go through an, a, 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 a uh, in process, and then we adjudicate that and come up with some finalists. Usually, every year we come up with six or eight finalists. These are people that we really think are, get the message on ethics. And then we send out a site visit team to go and visit to find out if this is just management speaking or if this is really well disseminated in, in among all the people in the organization. So we find those things out. We make a video of each of the finalists. So you video jocks, you ought to pay attention. Um, because we make a really neat video of all those companies. And then we have an award ceremony. And it's just like the, uh, the Academy Awards last weekend. Red carpet, and we, we walk down, and, 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 and the winners, or the, the, we don't call them winners, we call them recipients, get an ethi. And, uh, and they take it back and proudly. So they've got a video and an ethi. And what we're really trying to do is celebrate the good. Why is it that when we're th thinking about ethics, all we ever hear about in the press and on the news are the failures and the things that we should be ashamed about? That's all we ever hear about. Why aren't we hearing as much about the successes and where things are going well? So I'm here to encourage Denver to do something similar to that. You might want to put it in part of the conscious capitalism organization. To, to run a little uh, pilot to see if you might want to do something like this. It's pretty powerful because what we're doing in Rochester is we're changing the way the whole community views ethics, not from a negative point of view, but from a celebratory, what's going right point of view. And that's very, very engaging. Any questions on the ethics? I went over that pretty fast. Okay. Can you agree with this little, this little diagram here? What we're looking for in every organization is a kind of culture where our culture is so appealing to people that it's like a magnet and that we're able to reach out into the market and, and get and recruit the very best people to be on our team. 
And not only that, but once they arrive, they see that we really walk our talk and we really do what we say. And they would, they would say, I'd be crazy to leave this organization. Many of you work in organizations like that. Many of you don't. And so what we want to do is build cultures where it feels like that if you're a manager. Make sense? Data. I, sw I promised to share some steaming data. This isn't the steaming part. This is an article that was written by uh, Stephen Covey and Doug Douglas Conant, some of my cohorts. And uh, they, they uh, wrote an article from, in Harvard Business Review in 2016 that, about the great places to work. And you're all familiar with the great places to work. You may not be familiar with it, that two-thirds of the criteria are related to trust in some way. They found, and they even said in their paper, that trust is the defining characteristic <laughs> of the very best places to work. That was the consistent results. If you find trust, you're going to find a great place to work. And they said that high trust companies beat the S&P 500 by a factor of 3x. There's a lot of different studies that have been done. The range is somewhere between 2 and 5x. But the point is, if you're running a very high trust organization, you are tremendously advantaged from a financial point of view. Would you agree with that? And if you're running an organization that does not have high trust, you are operating against the curve. And we're going to look at that a little bit more. Myth, a lot of, I still run into some leaders that think that, that trust is soft, squishy stuff. It isn't. There's nothing soft and squishy. We don't sit around the campfire and sing kumbaya and toast marshmallows and stuff. We don't do that. When we work on trust, we work on something that's hard. Trust is a hard-edged measure. It can be measured, measured accurately in all kinds of ways. It's rather easy to measure trust, believe it or not. And uh, there's that same statistic. Trust, high trust groups are two to five times more productive. I'm going to talk about, this is some of the steaming data. This is data that came out less than a month ago. It's called Edelman Trust Barometer. I don't know if any of you ever run into that. It's Richard Edelman runs a study every year of 28 different countries. And he measures trust in four different areas. He measures trust in business, government, NGOs, non-government organizations, and the media. He measures it in 28 different countries and puts out a huge report. It takes me several weeks, usually, to work through his report and figure out what it's saying. This time, it didn't take me very long at all. In fact, when I was reading his thing, I was reaching to see if an oxygen mask was going to jump down from above my head because I was, my breath was taken away. I couldn't believe what I was reading. There was what I call a free fall of, in, in ethics in the United States during the year 2000, 2017. And I'll show you the data in a little more detail. Major changes hit all sectors, not just one. And the loss was historic proportion. I don't know how to say this any clearer than I've been studying this data as it comes back from Edelman for 15 years, ever since they've been doing it. And so I pay attention to what's going on country by country. Okay? And generally, here's what happens. If the trust, they, ha they have an index. They boil all the things, business, government, NGOs, and media, they boil it all into one thing they call a trust index for that country for that year. And from year to year, any one country generally will change a point or two points, two percentage points, something like that. They don't even pay attention if a country is changing up to five points. That's just noise to them, right? Because there's so much going on in 28 different countries. But if something's going more than 5%, they're paying attention. They're saying, something's going on over there. What is it? What's happening over there in France that gave this big boost to trust in one year? More than 5%? You've got to be kidding me. And then, so, it, but you never, ever see it go. I only remember seeing it one time going above a 10% difference from one year to the next. One time, I saw 11%. It was in Japan. 
Japan lost 11% from one year to the next year in the trust index. That's the biggest I ever saw. In the United States, in 2017, we went down 23%. That was the oxygen mask moment. I'm saying I've never seen, they have never seen anything close to that, anything even half that bad. Here's what it looks like if you take the different sectors, business, government, NGOs, and media, and then this is the combined index. This was the start of 2017. They actually take the data in November, so it was taken in November of 2016, and then again in November of 2017. And in that period of time, we went down 23 points. So a lot of things are going on, a lot of things in the mix there, and I'm not here to try to dissect and talk about what the various things are happening. But we have a huge opportunity here for the United States that most of us aren't aware of yet. This is so fresh, this data hasn't really been, how many of you saw this data before today? A couple, maybe one or two. It's news, it's big news. And so we collectively as a country have a lot of work to do over the next few years to get back to where even we were. Got it? Steaming data. This is what it looks like when you stack up the 28 countries. And I'm just going to look at this, the left side. This is in foreign publics. This is the general population. But the United States, and you can't read the detail, and you don't have to read the detail to get the message here. The United States was sixth from the top of the 28 countries that they measured at the end of 2016. At the end of 2017, we were dead last in the worst in the world. Worse than Russia and worse than Poland. And usually Russia and Poland duke it out for the last place historically. Most, most years they're, they're you know, and, and we beat them out for the last place. So we've got a huge opportunity to recover from that. It's what? China is on the top. Is that, does that shock you? No. Okay. And so a lot of people will say, well, it's because they can't say what they really think. Not true. That's not. This is a real. This is real. They have analyzed it and have written papers on it and books on it. This, if you're a person, because this is the, per, the people living in that country are m making, the, this isn't another country judging China. This is China people judging China. And they think things are better off. They think things are going pretty well. And if you're the average China person, you think things are going pretty well compared to what they used to be. Can you buy that? It's a little startling, but that's true. And China generally comes in as, as the number one trust country in the world. Other comments? I can't go into the, you know, the whys and wherefores of all the different countries, but this is pretty startling. I, I hope you would agree with that. This is a survey that I do. This is in my own business. When I go in and work with a company, I'll take a trust survey. It's very simple. It takes people about 10 or 15 minutes to, to put in. And basically, it tells me not only what the level of trust is in that organization, but where the soft spots are, where, where we need to dig in and do some work. So before I work with a management team, I'll, I'll take an instrument and, and, and measure it. I want, you to, I want to engage you in a survey right now. So I want you to think about your organization. And if you are a, a solopreneur, think about an organization that you've worked for recently or something. And pick on that scale from 1 to 10 where you think your organization is operating right now in terms of trust. This is a very gross measurement. You got the number in your mind? OK. How many of you believe the trust was between 3 and 4 percent, or 3 and 4? Okay, so about maybe less than a third. How many of you think trust was between 6 and 8? So more, more than half, about half. How many of you think it was 9 or 10? Excellent, awesome. How many of you think it was 1 or 2? Not too many. How many of you picked 5? One or two. Basically, I've done this experiment with groups, and I, I'm doing it in a shortened form here because we don't have much time. But generally, I would, I would have people you know, hand in ballots and stuff like that. And basically, what I find is you would expect to see a normal distribution. 
with a group this size, you would expect to see a normal distribution with a mean of maybe six or seven, something. Would you, isn't that what you'd expect to see? Never, ever, ever, ever see it. Always see a bimodal distribution with a bunch of people saying it ain't so good and another bunch of people saying it's pretty good. Don't see the nines and tens that I was seeing over here. So this is great. This is an unusually positive group. Generally don't get many ones and twos either. But there are no fives, almost no fives. It's always bimodal. Now why do you think that would be? Pretty black and white, yeah. It's a trick question when you think about it. I showed you this scale and I said, pick a number in your mind. What did you do in your mind? You immediately said, well, five is average. Am I right? Five must be average, whatever that is. And I think we're better than average, or I don't think we're as good as, you kinda, it kinda went like that before you even thought about it. And then you picked a number. How important would it be to an organization to be able to move two points to the right in less than a year? That's what I'm going to show you, what I, how I work with organizations to make that happen. Because it is possible to move two steps to the right in less than a year. This is a, this is a, a, a thing that, again, I try to do experientially, but I don't have enough time to do it the way I normally do. But the, if you look at these different bullets, Let's take the first one, solving problems. What's it like to try to solve problems if you're working in an organization of very high trust? Quick, Quick easy, easy yeah, fast, easy, efficient. We get better solutions because people are willing to speak up, take a chance, right? What's it like to solve problems if we have a very low trust group? Usually don't. <laughs> you may not even be able to get to the problem. You're so busy working around the interpersonal problems that are going on. So solving problems night and day, and Covey found that out in his research. How about let's take a couple more just so you get the idea. What If I'm in a group and we have a very high trust group, what is it that we're focusing on on a day-to-day -day basis? Outcomes. Outcomes. Mission. Mission. Relations. Customer. Relation, we're, we're focusing on what we're trying to accomplish. What, what are we doing here? And we're trying to do that. That's where our energy's going. What about if we're working in a group that has very low trust? What do we focus on in a low trust group? Survival. Mm -hmm. Survival. You know, maybe things are so bad, are we going to make it through? CYA. CYA. We generally focus on each other. In a low trust group, we're protecting our turf. We're trying to figure out what the other person's gonna do so we can get one step ahead of them and that kind of thing. So focusing on what we're trying to accomplish versus focusing on each other, can you see the difference there? And if you go around to these, all of these bullets there, you'll see that the difference between working in a high trust environment versus working in a low, let's take one more so you'll get the feel. If I'm a leader and I've got a high trust group, you're all working for me, but we're a high trust group. How perfect do I have to be? Not very. I have a license to be a human being and make mistakes. I have a license to do the best I can and not be staying up all night worrying how we're going to spin stuff to try to trick people. But if, it's a very, if, this, if this was a very low trust group and you're working for me, how perfect do I have to be? Absolutely perfect, because you're all coiled like snakes, ready to snap at me the minute I give you the opportunity. Is that right? So I hope you can convince yourself, without me going through the rest of them, that the, the, the leverage, if you have high trust, is immense. Make sense? And these are only nine areas. We could have picked 30. It doesn't matter. The point is, if you have low trust group, you're working so far again behind the eight ball, you're it's ridiculous. And if you do have high trust, you have such an advantage, it's unbelievable. So we're going to talk about how do we do it? How do we build trust? You know, the interesting thing is I have yet to meet a CEO of any company who doesn't want more trust. Have you? Have you? 
everybody's look, would, would, would welcome more trust. And if I say, how do we build trust? What are the things that we do to build trust? It's not rocket science at all. You, you can read, I don't have to read those 16 things. You can read them and you know them all, don't you? And, and there's lots more that I'm not having on the list, but the point is, this is not rocket science. How to build trust, we know how to build trust and we want to build more trust. So why are we so stinking bad at it? On average. There are leaders who feel like they know uh huh. They don't give a crap about trust, right? They lead their organizations to follow me. Okay. That's a blind spot. Okay. But I would maintain if you would sit down with them and ask them point blank if, they, if, they, if, if more trust in their organization would be good or bad, they would say good. It would be good. I want more. But I'm not doing the things on a daily basis. I'm doing things on a daily basis that shoot myself in the foot or take me in the wrong direction. And I maintain that there's a foundation. There's a kind of foundation that if I can get through to leaders, that if we can change these four, there's four things, four behaviors, that we can change them, then all these things work like they're on steroids. All these things work great. If we can't change those four things and we can't get through to leaders on these simple basic four foundational things, then I don't care how much, how much you work on these things, you're gonna make a tiny difference in trust. Can you all buy that logic? So let's took it, I wanna show you what the foundation is that I think I've discovered. It has four parts. First part I already talked about, the first law of trust. If you want more trust, if you wanna see more trust in your organization, you need to find ways to show more trust in them. Most leaders find that difficult to do, right? So that's one behavior. Second one is this issue of values. We talked about values a little bit before. Values are so special because there's things, there are words that we agree with. Words like what? Give me a value. Integrity. Integrity. That's a really common one. Okay, and it's also pretty easy, you know, either we have integrity or we don't. Okay, so, but what happens in organizations is that we have these lofty values that we've said, and then we don't act that way consistently. Let me give you the, the one that drives me the, the most crackers here. I'll walk into the lobby of a company, and I will see, and I've, I've heard people say this so many times, we have a value. People are our most important asset. And I record that, people are our most important asset. And then I go and I walk around the plant and I go to the back conference room where the supervisors are busy figuring out how they're gonna manage the downsizing because the market's gone soft and they gotta get rid of people. Wait a minute, if people are our most important asset, when the, when the market goes soft, we're not gonna downsize people, we're gonna train them. We're gonna get them ready for the next cycle. We're gonna figure out how we can utilize them to build our business more. We're not gonna get rid of them. If we're gonna do anything, we'll sell inventory or we'll sell a building. So if you have a value in the lobby that says people are our most important asset, but you don't act that way, don't you think that people in the organization know that and see that? And the minute you compromise on any of the values, and people realize that you say it, but you don't practice it, you're dead. Does that make sense? Balanced accountability is the third one, and that's what I talked about before, that uh, we, we seem to hold people accountable in a punitive way. It's like, mm, I'm holding you accountable for this. You did wrong, and you're, you're bad, and I, you know, I'm holding you accountable. Look. Most people on most days come to work with an attitude that I'm gonna do the very best I can and in most cases, they come into work and they do good work all day long. Am I right? Mo the majority of people do that. And yet, the only time they hear from their supervisor or their manager is when something didn't work out. What's wrong with this picture? Why can't we hold people accountable in a holistic way that takes into account the good things that they're doing 
as well as the things where they need some coaching. Or they may need a kick in the butt. That's okay. Right? So let's hold people accountable. I, have a, I invented a term for it. I have a paper on this. Uh, I call it holding people pro-accountable. You're going to hear from me based on what you're doing, good and bad. And therefore, for the 5% of the time that there needs to be some corrective action, well, that's okay because most of the time you're hearing good stuff from me. It's reflective of the good work that you're doing. So you can tolerate that better. Does that make sense? So balanced accountability is big. And this one is the biggie. This one is the one that I think carries more weight than anything. And this is what I try to teach leaders when I first work with them. You have to understand what these two words, reinforcing candor, what they mean and how to use them because this is the key to trust in any organization. Leaders have to understand how to reinforce candor. So what does that mean? I'm about to explain it to you. Reinforcing candor. This is the key points that we just talked about. Am I doing on time? We're okay. Can you buy into the analogy that trust is like a bank account? That we have trust, is, I'm talking now trust between people, is like a bank account. And there's a balance of trust. With every person that you know, there is a balance. And that we make <coughs> deposits to the trust account, and we can make withdrawals. You buy all that? Make sense? If I'm a leader, how easy is it for me to make small deposits in the trust account? Small ones. How easy is it? Easy. What are some of the things? Well, like those 16 things we said, we can do any of those things. Acting in a consistent way, da 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 da, -da. Those, will, those will make small deposits. How easy is it to make a big deposit in the trust account with any one action, if you're a leader? Hard. Why is it hard? We said it was easy to make small deposits. Why is it hard to make big deposits? Yes? Very good. It's not the kind of thing that happens every day. If you call me up, I'm up in the mountains camping, and you call me up and say, Bob, we got a customer coming in tomorrow. Can you come in and help me out? And I pack up my tent and get in the car and come back to help you out. That's a pretty big trust deposit because I went out of my way. It was an unusual situation that occurred. If I'm walking by your house and you run out and say, ah, my house is on fire, but my dog's in there, and I run in and get your dog, that's a pretty big deposit in trust because I'm risking my life to retrieve something of value to you. If I have to land a plane in the Hudson River, Probably that's a big deposit in trust, but I don't do that every day. So yes, something unusual has to be happening to make a big deposit. How easy is it to make little withdrawals in trust with people? If, very easy, right? Slip of the tongue, some poor wording, even body language in a meeting, it's very sensitive that we can lose, we can make small deposits. How easy is it to make a big deposit, a big withdrawal in trust? Just as easy, okay? So the deck is stacked. And I have a little, I don't know if this is the video, is this the video? No, yeah, this, I built a little device here. I don't travel with it because the TSA people freak out. They get, <laughs> they get the dogs out and the supervisors and they have to sign all these papers and stuff. So I don't travel with this anymore, but I do. Speaking of trust, they don't trust. So, but I have a little video of me, it's two and a half minutes long, that explains how this thing works. I hope you got enough volume. Hi, this is Bob Whittle, and I'm also called the Trust Ambassador. I wanted to share a very brief analogy with you about trust and how trust is built and lost over time. It has to do with this barometer I made up. Basically what it is is it keys off the idea that trust is like a bank account. We have this balance of trust with people and we can either make deposits to the trust account or we can make withdrawals. And so what I like to do is, is show people how when trust is there 
and we build trust, we usually build it in small increments. We don't build it in large increments. Basically, we do things like we, we're consistent with people. That's a small deposit. Or we walk our talk. We do what we say we're going to do. It's a small deposit. We're, we're, we're ha happy and we're nice with people. Basically, all the things that we do day to day, every day, uh, build up the relationship with the other people with the relationship of trust. And it grows to a, a, a good balance. Unfortunately, when there's a withdrawal, it tends to look like this. So we had built up a high balance of trust, but it was all wiped out in maybe one sentence, or an email, or even some body language. But look at this. When we would go and, what would we do if we lost trust? What we're going to do is try to build it back. So we're going to do all the things we did before to make deposits. We're going to walk our talk. We're going to be nice with people. We're going to give good feedback. We're going to pray with people when they do well. We're going to do all these things. But you notice I'm making deposits day after day after day after day, and nothing's happening to the trust account, to the trust level. It takes an awful long time to build back the equity to where our deposits are actually registering the trust. But look at this. What if you set up an organization such that when trust was was high and then we had a withdrawal, instead of it crashing down, it looked like this? That would make a huge difference because now as soon as we start making deposits, we're immediately building back the equity. And that's the concept that I call reinforcing candor. And we're going to talk about it in this program and how effective it is at making that phenomenon work in our lives. Like my little game? <laughs> so what is this thing called reinforcing candor? It really goes back to the fear issue, and that's why fear is so important in trust. Because if we tell people that you can share with me your concerns, if you think, see me doing something that you don't think is right, not only do I expect you, I really want you to tell me that, because it gives me the opportunity to reinforce your candor, to make you glad you brought it up. See, most leaders can't do that. And do you know why they can't do that? You see, every leader, I'm going to play the role of a leader here. So I wear this button all day long. I have this button on. And the reason I have this button on, everybody see it? it's an I am right button. By the way, I have a few, a few of them. I don't have enough for everybody, but if you really want one, you can come and grab one after the show. But the idea is this. Everything that I do and say and think and write, in my mind, is consistent with what we're supposed to be doing. It's consistent with the values. It's consistent with what we need to do as a company, et cetera. I've got it all rationalized up here, and I am right. Does that make sense? Every leader is coming at every decision from this point of view. So now think about it. If an employee comes up and says, yeah, I don't see it that, that be, that's, that's exactly the right thing to be doing. Well, now, I already believe this, right? I already, I already know this, right? And somebody's coming up and approaching me with the opposite point of view. If you disagree with me, then by definition, you're wrong. And so I'm going to be coming at you from a point of view of trying to disarm, to try to, try to prove to you what you did. You didn't get it. You didn't understand it. Let me explain it once again or something like that. I'm going to punish you in some way for your candor. Does that make sense? And so therefore, it's this one-sided thing. And it's all because of this. So I said, what would happen if I gave every single person in this room an I am right button? Again, I don't have enough to do that. But you, some of you can take some. Take them home and enjoy them at home. Right? And most people do this. I need one for me and one for my wife. Okay. So, but if, if I just mentally, what I try to teach leaders is that whether or not they have an I am right button or whether their people have a, that's irrelevant. The 
point is what I'm trying to teach leaders is when someone's coming up to you and saying, I don't see it that way, they do it in an appropriate way, you know, you have to do it at the right time in the right way, but basically don't, don't climb down their neck and try to prove that they're wrong. Basically, I have to shift the conversation. The conversation now becomes, holy cow, I didn't see it that way. I came up with a different conclusion. And we, we're both looking at the same phenomenon, and, it, uh, and I didn't see it that way. I need to find out what, what, what you're thinking. Tell me more. So it switches me from a, you, you dummy, that kind of approach, to a, holy cow, I've got to listen to what you have to say. You have some important input that I might need to hear. And that changes everything. Because at the end of the day, then you're saying, well, at least he's willing to listen. Okay? So not only am I willing to listen, but I'm going to make sure that I've heard you. So if you say, Bob, that's not consistent with our value about how we're treating people, I'm going to say, wow, I didn't see it that way. Tell me, tell me wh where I missed it. Tell me more. So I'm going to confirm, and you're going to tell me, well, it's because of this and this and this, and I'm going to say, oh, so in your opinion, this is the way it is. So I'm going to confirm what you're telling me that I understand. Okay? That means what? That means I've heard you and internalized it, and I'm respecting you as an adult. I'm treating you like an adult rather than a child, right? And so therefore, and I may say, well, that's a very interesting opinion. I wonder what other people in the room think about that. I might get more information. I might say, I got to think about this for a few days. I, don't, I, I can't come up. Or I might say, I hear you and I'm very grateful for that input because I just didn't see it that way. I still think what I was doing is the right thing to do and I'm going to say that we're going to go ahead and do that. And I really will appreciate your support when we do. But I mostly want you to be grateful, I mostly want to be grateful to you for bringing it up. Now you're going to go away, glad you brought it up, right? And that's the shift. If we can get leaders to do that consistently, that changes the ball game. And I've done it in many organizations where in six months or eight months down the road, you've made at least two shifts to the right in that organization in terms of trust. And it's huge in terms of performance. Does that make sense? That's the theory. So, key point, work to build trust, build emotional intelligence, reduce the blind spots. And this point in the red, the culture in any organization is more dependent on what's going on with the senior most leader than any other factor. Would you all agree with that? Can you agree with that? Because it, I, that has been my observation. So therefore, if an organization isn't working well, I know where to look for the problem. Because if we want to change the trajectory of an organization, it's like a comet. We can go and take every particle in the tail of the comet and try to move it to a different orbit. Or we can change the, head of, change the trajectory of the head of the, of the comet and make a lot faster progress. That makes sense? So that's where we need to work. Uh, last thing I have here is just healing a, a, a breach of trust, the idea being that, um, have you all experienced a breach of trust in your life? And it's a pretty uh, rotten feeling, isn't it? And so what I, I want to turn this around a little bit because quite often what happens is when people uh, have a breach of trust, first of all, they feel terrible because they had a relationship with someone that they valued. And now something happened. And now it's gone. And I feel crappy about that. Well, here's the first piece of advice. Don't procrastinate. Don't hope it's going to get better and go away. Go find out, go talk to this person because you had a relationship of trust that was valued by you and the other person. What you want to do is go to the other person and say, gee, something happened here. I'm not sure what it is. We need to dig it out because I don't feel good about our relationship as I did last week and I would love to get back to where we were. Would you like that too? And if the other person says yes, they're willing to work on it, then you go into, this is marriage counseling 101. I don't even need, need to describe it. It's, it's very simple. What happened? 
you know, what, was, was there an obvious thing that one person did something wrong? Was there an apology needed? All, what can we do to repair? But here's the deal. What, what I want you to focus on is when we have a trust withdrawal or trust betrayal, don't think of it as a catastrophe. Think of it as an opportunity. Because if you handle it well, timely, maturely, forthrightly, working adult to adult, you can make that relationship stronger than it was before the betrayal. And what an opportunity that is. And a betrayal is something that happens. It's a square wave that happened in a relationship, but it has the seeds of an opportunity if we'll grab it and make that relationship stronger than it ever was before. Can you buy into that? So that's the process. Don't procrastinate, go to work on it. So those are the final points that uh, I'm, I was making. As you can see, it was kind of tight to fit all that information into the footprint that I was given that day. Usually I, I take a little more time and do some experiential things with the audience. I want to offer you some video work that you might find interesting. There's three demo videos, and if you go to this address, you'll see that there's three that you can look at at no cost. If you're interested in the whole program, there's 30 videos in it, and the normal cost is $100. But since I'm the author of it, I can give you a discount of a total of only $30, $29.95. You use the discount code TRUST and you'll get that discount. So I hope that's of interest to you and I hope you'll look into some of my programs on my website www.leadergrow.com. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you later.